you've heard from the Collect today, we give thanks for Luke the Evangelist. There are two places that are pointed out in Scripture where we hear a little about Luke, one of which was read this morning. There's pathos in it. We get the sense as we're reading this that Paul is in prison. And he's listing all these people who've left him, who've abandoned him. Or people that he, still in his capacity as apostle in the Mediterranean, is sending off. This one's going to Troas and the like. And then he says, only Luke is with me. Mm -hmm. And it says volumes about the healing friend posture that was Luke that is in fact reflected in the way Luke portrays Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Because if there is any gospel that portrays Jesus as friend of sinners, as the one who stands with marginalized, outcast women, it's here in the Gospel of Luke. And all of that is really encapsulated by the scripture, the quote from Isaiah that Jesus reads, and in essence, his public inauguration in the ministry after being tempted by Satan in the desert. And those characteristics that I want to talk about very, very briefly in this actually Luke Acts volume are meant not only to be a shorthand description of the ministry of Jesus, they are also very cl clearly seen in description as Jesus' ministry through his church in the book of Acts. So it's not just a ministry of the earthly life of Jesus. It's also a description of the life of Jesus through his church. And therefore, it's very relevant. Not only to us see, you know, whose Messiah is this? What's he like? What's important to him? How do we follow him? But it's also a way of saying, okay, it's like a checklist. How is he expressing himself through his church? And what does that, in fact, look like? So... I want to brief, briefly make some comments on this. This is, of course, Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Come. In other words, stop and think about this. Jesus returns, empowered by the Spirit of God, from his successful encounter with the evil one. And the assumption all through Luke Acts is that anything that we do for the sake of the kingdom of God has its source, its empowerment, and its end result through the work of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's not just kind of my idea, but instead, and importantly so, where we begin if we are to be as church is God, if there's anything that we need, it's Pentecost, because I need the pouring out of your spirit. If you're going to have me do the things that this says I'm supposed to be doing, it is impossible for me to do it otherwise. You know, we're, I mean, we're not the Rotary Club at prayer. It, it's something far more supernatural than that. And it's incredibly important. So I don't want to just sort of pass over that. It's worth sort of thinking about Particularly as Paul would command us later to be, in the Greek, be ever being filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And then what's he, in essence, anointing me by the Spirit to do? Because the, less, the rest are to-dos. One, he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. In Jesus' context, and also in ours, there's always that passion about not just making sure that the people who show up in the synagogue hear the good news, but the community, especially those who are least likely to show up, hear the good news. That's the context for the poor. We're talking about those that others would forget, those who are not particularly considered important in the eyes of society and the like. It's, there's an intentionality you see about this. It, it's not meant to say what I'm going to do is hop, skip over everybody else and get to the poor. It means I'm going to make sure I keep getting so far out that the people on the outer edge of the social circle, the poor, also are included in the ministry that we do. In other words, there's the assumption that in a local church, 
A local church, in fact, looks like the strata of the community in which that church is surrounded. It's never merely a club for any particular subgroup. It's, in fact, meant to look like the whole community in some fashion or another, and that includes the people who are, who are on the outer circle, in this case, the poor. That so runs through New Test the New Testament, even as Paul is talking about when he was commissioned to go and reach the Gentiles. There's this really amazing quote in Galatians, where as he's going about what he wants, what he's called to do, and they're saying, you know, you've got the right hand of fellowship, go for it, Paul. And the only thing they add, this is Galatians 2.10, they asked only one thing, that we would remember the poor. In other words, like, don't forget, which was actually what I was eager to do, Paul says. In other words, no matter what you're thinking about, how is it affecting the least of these? How are we going to include the least of these? Who, what about the needs in our community? That's always a front and center concern. How are they going to see and hear the expression of the good news. Because it is, in fact, good news. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and the recovery of slight sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. And what we're describing here in the life of Jesus is both supernatural spiritual gift manifested in ministry, real healing miracles. An ability to be able to, as well, speak prophetically to oppressive social structures that marginalize those people that God cares about, whether they be religious or political. It's all in here if you look at the life of Jesus. And then out of that, to create this posture, and in some ways this sums up all of the rest, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You mean, we're not here to make new rules. We're here to declare jubilee, mm -hmm. forgiveness, mercy, welcome, the lifting of the burdens. And that's our approach, regardless of those to whom we meet. Even if we speak a word of correction to those who oppress, we do so because we know enough to know, because of the sin in our own heart, that the oppressor is just as burdened as the oppressed. So even in the word of correction, there is the word of good news. Now, I have to say, as the bishop of the diocese, a part of what I'm always asking inside is, how does Central Florida look like this or not look like this? as a diocese, because I believe with all my heart that what we are called to do is, in the place where God has planted us, to express the very ministry of Jesus by his power. The goal is really not, in the end, to be good Episcopalians. The goal, in the end, measure the statue of the fullness of Christ, quote Paul, quote Paul in Colossians, is to express the ministry of Jesus in the place where we have been called. That's our context. You know, whether it's Orlando or Palm Bay or Den Allen or it doesn't matter. How does God call us as a body of people to express his ministry in the world? And how has God called me to do that? So that wherever I am, I'm aware that I'm there on Christ's behalf. Whether that's in my office or down at Panera down the street or wherever I am, I'm his. And I'm there for him. That's what the Spirit is empowering us to do. Mm -hmm. And to do so in the posture of that Lucan friend that stands by, honors, and cares for the sake of the Christ who is the friend to all of us. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Amen.